All right. I didn't hear any music. Was there music? Okay. I'm getting I the thumbs it. up. You I heard, heard it? it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did it sound good? Welcome to the show. Um, the idea for today's show actually came from Seneca College, uh, who uh, always watch and, uh, and uh, hopefully are watching again because this is your, your Christmas present. You wanted this show um, where we'd put together uh, Crispin, Porter, and Bogusky um, back together again. It's well, been should, a while. Seneca College in Toronto. In Toronto. In Toronto, Canada. Canada. Uh, planet Earth. And uh, Sam Crispin is um, to my far right. And, and Sam started Crispin Porter, um, started Crispin in right. 1965. Right. I'm glad you don't. I, well, <laughs> I know. I just, time ago. <laughs> I just heard that. I'm going to learn a lot today <laughs> about the history of the agency. Right. But people, you know, people um, don't necessarily know the, uh, that the agency traces itself all the way back there. And you know, like Chuck knows that even even as long as we've been there, you joined the agency in eighty eight. Um, Chuck Porter, ladies and gentlemen, eighty eight. Eighty eight. Yes, he was writing copy for us. What, what year did you come down here? Seventy one. Seven, nineteen seventy one. That's what Rick Green brought brought you in the office one That's day right. and said you'll like him. And when you first met him, he was kind of a hippie. Would you say he was uh, kind of a hippie? Well, it depends on what degree of hippie does you want. He did need a haircut. His sandals are on. There's a good. There's it was, a good. It was. The, it was the seventies. It was. The you 70s. don't. I don't know. I don't know if you can zoom in on this. I don't know if you look like a hippie quite. That's Chuck right there. Those um, are my two partners. Great I, copywriters. Now that's a and that's a yeah that's um, a great office too. I mean I wish we had that wallpaper still. Is that Rick Green? And that's Rick, Rick Green Rick and Joel Green right Orblo, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you you don't look quite like a hippie, but you definitely look like you don't give a shit. About well, it. That's, you know, that's a perfect answer. <laughs> <laughs> I was never a very good hippie. I was like a pretend hippie, right? Like a weekend hippie, because you wanted to make a few bucks. Well, yeah, but I mean, also, I mean, back then, it was before I was married. Girls kind of liked hippies, you know. So, <laughs> oh, okay. like, if you go out, you're a hippie, and then when right. you go to work, you know? <laughs> although, yeah, I did wear sandals, and and those two guys were copywriters. Uh, when I first came to Miami, they were a copywriting sort of team called Werblow and Breen, and, and I had heard of them because they won awards, and I read about them in Advertising Age, and I went and talked to them and said, you know, I'm a writer, and I'm a really good writer, and my samples are in the mail, and there were no samples, I've never written any. <laughs> and there was no mail. There, there was, was no, no mail. stamp. There was no samples in the mail, and, and they said, this is the truth, and they said, we'll try you for a week. So you got one week. So. And they, then they drug him into my office. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, one thing led to another. And Sam, you started in advertising in 1950? About 1951, too. I worked for Grant Advertising originally. This is this is Sam right here. That's 1959. In Grant Advertising, which still around? Oh no, Grant! At that time, it was the largest agency in the world, and uh, over the years, they deteriorated down to, the, to actually, nothing. They, They're they, gone. What they did, they they will see Grant hired a financial man to take over the operation of the agency, and it took them about 10, 15, maybe 15, 20 years to put the business out of. And there, there you have there it is. And there you have there it a is. parable for our time. Yes. For agencies have to be somewhat creative led, I guess. <laughs> That's in your exactly opinion. right. Yeah. I mean when you start <laughs> now you, you, make rules. A, you you but you're an account guy. Right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. But you still felt like creative was important. Absolutely. And um and at some point uh um you decided that you you I, I remember before Chuck was here, you didn't really have a creative director, right? Brain Actually, what I, what I did was I um, knew the best writers I could get my hands on with it was this team. Here, World Road Green, yeah. and them, them Porter. So you tried to tear up that company That's right, for so your I, own... Yeah. And so I was able to do that. <laughs> and then Chuck came in and sort of gradually edged the both of them out. So. <laughs> but what, wait, what made you decide that you needed a, a creative director? Because you, you were successful, things were good, you didn't have a creative director, you just outsourced all the creative. That's right. Uh, I don't know at the time, it just seemed to be right. And uh, I missed him, actually. So <laughs> really? <laughs> he brought his dog to the office first thing, you know, and so then he brought his secretary been with him for how long have been Meg, but he's been with you. Yeah, a long time. So, so it was so. nostalgia. He should have moved in, you know, heard the, you heard about the camel in the tent. Yeah, right. <laughs> and and, and you, you were telling me earlier that Chuck um, it was was famous for being late to everything. Well, I accuse missing you deadlines, missing deadlines. <laughs> I, I was I was I was challenged. 
and no. I'm okay with that. I was, I, and I'm, I'm over it now. I was a kid. Well, and you've turned it into sort of a, you spin it in a pretty positive way. I remember when I, when I came to the agency, your, your attitude, uh, teaching, I guess, your teaching was the best work is always done when the client's in the lobby. That so was um, always my I was experience. almost encouraged to be <laughs> well, late, right? Chuck always liked to give everything the last shot. Yeah. And this is especially 10 years, well, the inter, we had the Intercontinental Hotel Corporation, headquartered in New York. So we'd have our meetings to go up with our wonderful Ellie Leslie and Joan Cassidy. How can we both forget them? I hope they're not watching this. <laughs> and Sam, Sam was saying that, that uh, most of the time, if there was a meeting and, and uh, you guys were about to get on the plane, he would not really know what he was about to present because it wasn't done yet. That you would no, show he up. A, he, he managed to get it typed up someplace between the airport yeah. and home. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But I mean, I, I, you know what? I don't apologize. For no, that. it was okay. He, he was giving that. his best shot. Yeah, it was yeah. always his best shot. Well, and, and I think you know, it, it has. We we still, you know, the CPB is all about the fact that you know, great works never finish. It's just abandoned. You run out of time, <laughs> yeah, that's right? True. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And so you know, you keep going until till the end. We do try to start a little earlier than you know the night before or the drive to the airport. Now well, we're better that's than changed. we used to. Be. I yeah. mean, you know, we used to be littler and we used yeah. to things were you know a little bit looser but i mean we we didn't miss very many deadlines i don't think we missed any deadlines. no but we no. didn't we just didn't get the work done and leave us a lot of time because i think <laughs> that that i mean that leads to bad you know idle hands or the devils you want people busy right up until yeah the pitch yeah yeah so or it leads to golf yeah that's right things yeah, like yeah, that which yeah, you don't yeah. want to do so yeah it was but i think that was you know i mean i i mean i still see in the agency now you know, it's it, for one thing, we never have three months to do work like some big agencies. I mean, I can remember when we were a little agency and we always got everything done fast because, I don't know, because that, those were what the deadlines were like. And I always thought, wow, what a luxury to have like a year to work on a campaign. And the reality is it's not. Uh, all you do is end up wasting a lot of time. A and I still believe that pressure and friction creates better work than relaxation does. Yeah. So what, what, what's, what do you think is the perfect amount of time? I'd say, I'd say probably noon to five, 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 five <laughs> solid hours yeah. at your desk. Yeah, probably, if, you, if right. you work the entire time. If you work the entire time, yeah, yeah. yeah was right there from, from noon to five. Hard to argue with well, that. Well, let me leave this a little positive, though, Nate. Uh, obviously, the copy was never bad. It was always great on top, yeah. so i got to say that. That was yeah. good work. It yeah, was, was always good. interesting to make sure the headline we used, the layout, layout matched the copy, though. Yeah, uh, well, sometimes, yeah. Well, it's because of art directors. That's the problem with art directors. They don't, you know. Uh, so Sam doesn't have a creative director. He's got this agency. There's no creative director or really a creative department, I guess, right? Well, actually, there was a creative director. There was a guy, Carlos Dominguez, who was an art director. Oh, okay. Who yeah. really sort of, He's a coordinator. Yeah, he was. But, but, but his title was creative director. Yeah. But he wasn't. He, you know, wasn't. he didn't really function. He was, but wasn't. And Sam comes to you and says, uh, hey, I want you to join Crispin. Yeah, well, Sam and I talked about it for, I make very lightning fast decisions. So Sam and I talked about this for approximately seven years. Yeah, we, okay. we made instant decisions. Yeah, for days. seven we, years we talked about it. And we used to work a lot on the government of Jamaica. And I can remember we were down in Jamaica, we were in Kingston. We had gone to a meeting with the Jamaica Tourist Board. And we were having a red stripe beer afterwards. And Sam said, Look, what, let's finally do this. Write down on a yellow pad what you want to do to do this. So I wrote a bunch of stuff and I said, uh, this, uh, and Sam said, okay. And I said, I'd like to write more, if that's the case. And, and, so, we, and so we did it. You know, we, You'd like to add zeros? Yeah, or, or yeah. something. Yeah, yeah some yeah. more stuff. But, I mean, it was, we always had, you know, Sam always, even when he didn't have, like, a, didn't have a really potent creative department, always believed in and sold great creative and won lots of awards. And basically, at the time that I joined the agency, we mostly had tourism accounts. We had that's Jamaica right. and Intercontinental Hotels, and I think we had... British West Indies Airlines, a lot of tourism accounts. And so, and, and within that realm, they did brilliant work and they won yeah. lots of awards. And so, right. so there was always a creative tradition at the agency, but it was never in the house. And I think Sam had a sense that maybe it would be better to get it inside. But it, and it was always called, it was always Crispin. And yeah, then right. part of the part of the your ask or part of the offer was we're going to add your name to it yeah. as well. well yeah, right? well, because I, mean, I, I had never had an agency job. And so, I was a freelancer, and then I created a little sort of a, a creative boutique called Porter Creative Services. So since I was a kid, I'd always have my name on the door, and I couldn't imagine, 
I mean, that was just part of the deal. So, yeah. Yeah. So it became. Pristine. Was that weird for you to think, okay, I'm going to add this other name? Of this hippie, <laughs> and add this hippie name. To the... no. People accuse us of being that way anyway, so might as well be totally yeah. guilty of it. Chuck so. wasn't a hippie by that point. No, I mean, no, that no, was... very... no, I was married with two children. And... Very dressed yeah. up right. like yeah, he is yeah. now, and you know, very preppy. tied together. Kind yeah. of preppy yeah, yeah, yeah. at that yeah. point. That's right. Um, and so you, you obviously don't regret that decision. That was a no. good decision. <laughs> obviously not. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and um, one of the things that, that uh, um, is interesting, to, I, I think, about the agency is is at some point, um, Chuck and I guess myself, you know, we, we bought you out of the agency. That's right. Yet you, yet you always stayed involved. I mean, I, I've always admired this. You always stayed involved. You always came in. We always had an office here for you. And you were always the biggest fan of the agency, I think. Well, you know, anytime you get a free Wall Street Journal and New York Times, you can come in and read, you know. It's <laughs> <laughs> so, and I had a wife. She's glad to see me get the hell out of the house. So Yeah. And, and the dog would like to come in here. So it was The dog nice, loved it here. The yeah. dog loved it. Yeah. So, But I remember, you know, being at the agency and we'd have a big win like Truth. And literally the first person that would send me the article and congratulate me on, on most of the uh, most of the things that happened in the agency was you yeah and really really supportive and i don't know if that's i don't think it's typical at all in in terms of what happens as you know agencies evolve and yeah. people come and go well it's sort of probably go back sort of like family well you know i met you cutting boards yeah we were mother and father and there's and I didn't meet you until after your dad came back from service. You were you didn't go in when I didn't meet you with your uncle there. Yeah, but but as soon as your dad came back to service, because your mother was there working with Al, if I remember right. I think so. Yeah, yeah. and uh, God, that was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, well, you met me probably when I was doing deliveries. That oh. could have been the other time. I used to do deliveries for that's the That's right, for the delivery agency. plus cutting boards, that's yeah. right. Yeah, well, I'd cut some boards. <laughs> he cut the boards and delivered them too, so, yeah. so that's... that's the, I was a delivery kid. <laughs> this, is, this seems a very incestuous thing. It goes back a long, long it really way. really does. I think way further back than most you people You basically know. have to be born into this agency, you kinda I do. think, yeah, in yeah, some ways. Well, I'm going to like it to, well, the U.S. hockey team. Uh, I, up at the village where I live right now, there's a former hockey referee and he was working for Notre Dame. I don't know what he did up there, but anyway, uh, he he got talking about the hockey team. He's a former hockey referee and coach and and remarking about the idea of, of playing this group together who had played together and had and had ties to go way back against just having all stars in a team. And uh, they proved it last night. I guess the Canadian hockey team was vastly favored. Everyone these people I was seeing on a daily basis here, hockey fans, just felt kind of had it blown yeah. hands down before the game. Yeah. But they came out and they, five to three, I mean, that's an amazing hockey score when you get down to it. It's like three generations of Miami advertising, that's exactly basically. Right. Yeah. Is what, three generations. Because you know, <laughs> Jeff, Jeff Hicks also was, you know, I, I've also. known Jeff since I was 12, well, you know, I guess. People don't know that Alex's father was one of, was an extraordinarily talented designer. Some, some people know. Some people don't know, but, but but he had a studio called the Brothers Bogusky with with Alex's uncle. And when I first came here, right out of school, they were the best designers in town and were for a long, long time. And I don't know if anyone knows this story, but when I first went and joined Sam and it became Crispin Porter, you know, we, we didn't have really great designers. And so I sent some work over to Bill Bogusky, to his studio, to do. And it came back, and they were layouts. We used to have a client called Magnum, which made these big luxury yacht sort of boats. And the layouts came back, and they were the most they were the most arresting, engaging print ads I had ever seen. And I called Bill and said, Bill, these are amazing. You really uncorked one here. And he said, Alex did them. And Alex, I think, was 23 at the time. Yeah. And so I called Alex, and I said, you know, we got to talk. You should come over and join the agency. And do it. So Alex came in, and his voice had just changed. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you ought to come and join us. We're going to go on a journey here. It's going to be great. And he said, well, that, that would be interested in that. And I said, how much do you want? And he named a figure that was exactly twice what he was worth. Exactly twice. <laughs> so, but it's the last time we ever talked about money from that on. Money but he was looking ahead. He was looking, ahead. he was looking ahead. He was looking ahead. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you, before that, prior to that, I was working at another agency in town. Ryder and Shield. I, yeah. Ryder and Shield. And I had, was working really hard to try to impress my bosses there and, um, and not really getting anywhere. 
And I and I remember um, at some point you had seen some stuff I had done for Marriage Jewelers. Oh, your father. Do you remember sent that? It to me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you would love that stuff. I said it's brilliant. Yeah. And that brilliant. that was very encouraging to me. And, and actually, the reason why I left and started working with my dad was I was kind of I I had this planned out you where I would eventually I was angling. angling. I, was I always said it was my idea, but apparently it was <laughs> I was working idea. on it. And yeah. then and the number I threw out was was another thing that I was working on too. <laughs> <you know? laughs> okay. Um. But this is this is a, a clipping from when Chuck uh, first joined, uh, and it became Crispin and Porter Advertising. Okay. And there's Chuck right there. So we've got I don't know where are these scrapbooks. Your mom keeping these? No, or? no, no. These are our. We have a, a fully um, functioning PR department. So it, and this I don't know if you can zoom in that much, but that's when I was named partner, um, which was which was ninety two. Ninety two. Ninety two. Oh, this is a, this is a good shot. That is right after my voice changed. Doing some doing some late '80s, early '90s hair there too. It was good. It worked great. It worked great. Um, what's the craziest thing you've ever seen Chuck do in your time together? That's an interesting question. <laughs> Nothing crazy. No, I never did. Well, sort of the whole thing had an underlying <laughs> layer of crazy. So I mean, it's hard to separate. Right, so. <laughs> right. Well, you were you were in the you were in the business. Um, you ever see that show Mad Men? Do you watch that show Mad Men? I've it's seen it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't watch it, but but it's it's about that era. You know, That's the fifties right. and sixties. Yeah, sixties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were there. You were living that era. That's right. You know, you you were telling a story about being in the in the Bahamas, and you know, the way accounts moved was a little different than maybe they do. Oh yeah, no, no, that was here. I don't know if you remember, Sam. There, there's a guy from an unnamed Caribbean destination who was a big sort of hotelier down there um, who had a, a pretty big account for that time. And I can remember he was sitting in, in the old office that we used to have in Coral Gables, when, I think right, right after it became Crispin Porter. And we were sitting with him and he's like, well, my account's in New York. If I move it to Miami, I, I would have to come and visit you guys and I would need a Mercedes while I was in Miami. And I thought, well, you should get one then. That'd be good, you know, because <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah. And but there was there was a lot of business that got done that way, particularly in the Caribbean. Sam's like then. Chuck. Chuck, you don't understand. Uh, He's Sam is like. Sam, yeah, well, let me Sam explain how this. Said, well, yeah. no. Sam basically said, okay, we'll come back to that. We'll come back. To that. <laughs> and then I think he sent me out. We get some coffee. Yeah. Or like yeah. That, Chuck, so. you want to yeah. let, let me close this deal? You're going to want to go he outside. Never, he never got the Mercedes. No, he didn't. No, no. He didn't. <laughs> but there yeah. were there were a lot of people like that. Uh, particularly oh, yeah. in the tourism business back then. It oh, was, yeah. Well, there was one country, Ireland, that came to me wanting to know if I had any account. And I said, no way, because they were infamous for that. And the agency up in Orlando thought they were taking the agency out from underneath us. They made all sorts of promises. The guy wanted a brand new Buick. And I found out later, after they took over the account, about three months later, I got a call. I said, Sam, and there was a first name basis guy in my life. I said, about that country account and they said that well what about it? he said uh, you know we took that account away from me how were you, how were you collecting the bills I said well first of all I didn't ever send him a bill because I never did work I refused to work what do you mean you really work I said uh, I said what are you in the in the hole for he said well I bought this guy a house up here in, <laughs> in Orlando <laughs> and then and I got him a new car and he took it to, to the island and we've got to collect any money. <laughs> and you know, I said, thanks. Let me know if you ever collect the money. I can, I I can tell that's a long time ago because the guy wanted a Buick. <laughs> yeah, a Buick. I, exactly right. Yeah, that could have been 100 years ago. <laughs> um, this we got some more clippings here that we can show. What's the... Um, this one's great. Oh, that's from 92 or 3? Yeah, this is 93, it looks like. I, can you get in that tight? This is the uh, Southeast Agencies, hottest agencies of 92. Um, West is number one, Harris-Rie Cohen, Long Hames Carr, and Crispin is number four, and the Martin Agency is number five. And I think every, all, everyone, the, the top, top three, three are, are gone. gone. They're yeah, gone. They're all, yeah, they're you know? all gone. Yeah. So, uh, and Martin's obviously kicking, kicking ass. They did okay. Yeah, they did well. Um, and there's with Crispin gone, Porter takes on a new role. What was your new role exactly? President. I became president of the agency, and, and you became creative director. And it was, you know, looking back on it, I guess it was important. 
<laughs> Don't forget, oh, becoming I got promoted too. I became President Emeritus. Emeritus. And oh, Sam yeah, became, yeah. Sam became President yeah. Emeritus, and, and I became President. And, and, and there were people, I can remember, there was a person at one of the trade publications who said to someone in the agency, that guy is a writer. He doesn't know how to run a business. I give him a year. I mean, literally, he said that. And it got out in the press and somewhere they said, well, you know, there's some questions of whether these guys are even going to be able to stay in business. Whether you well, know how to run a business. Yeah, because, I, you know, because there was nobody there running it. I was yeah. like, well, let's backtrack a minute. We didn't have exactly many friends in the agency business. No, that's true. That's a good question. And that question has come in yeah. but from Twitter. If you have any questions, you can, you can tweet them in. Um, we're taking them live. But... Uh, the question, the question came in about what was Miami and the Miami ad business like, you know, back in the day? Actually, I was not very involved in Miami ad business. First of all, people on the beach never paid their bills, and I had a bad habit of paying bills. Yeah. And uh, uh, we had things like Bertram Yacht for the first six years. We had Miami Lakes for 26 years, a new town development. Yeah. North Dade. And, but that was about the extent of it down here. We had a couple of hotels, like Lagomar. Then we started working for uh, Intercontinental Hotel Corporation, Latin American Division. And then we ended up taking the whole account over. And incidentally, the very large old agency that had the account then never would admit that they lost the account to us. And for 26 years, they kept it on their list of accounts they had in our kind of hotels and then it was it was a joke all yeah. the media all the media people come by and laugh because they had to come down to miami to see to talk to, to the wrong agency you know yeah so, but the miami scene was really competitive i mean i remember oh yeah you know, very much so like very cutthroat and it the was, agencies yeah, yeah. knew each other and they would sling a lot of mud and well yeah. there were only four four or five i mean when we first did our deal there were probably four or five serious agencies in Miami and and they were other than Sam who was doing a lot of business in New York and other places the rest of them were all pitching the same dozen accounts the bank and the you know whatever it was yeah. mostly local accounts so yeah it was it was it was not a very fraternal group it was no yeah. one no so so uh um you, you started you started getting at it but but um at some point uh you decided to turn over the creative reins to me or try to. It didn't happen overnight. It was a little bit. It took about a year. You <laughs> quit twice. The first year you quit twice. I quit. Remember, a you left times. a note that said, "I want to be. I want to be an art director guy. I don't want to be creative director." It was, art director is the greatest job in the is, world because yeah. you have so much fun, and then you, if anything goes wrong, you got people to blame. Yeah, right? that's true. Whereas creative director is somewhat miserable. You know, there's no one else to blame. Well, that's the, kind of you, you know, know. I mean, th there are really two reasons that I, when I decided you that I would make you creative director. Reason one is that I have been doing it for a long, long time because I've been a freelance writer for a long time and it's a really hard job and I was exhausted. And, and reason two is you were so much better at it than me. So those were really the two, those reasons. Were the two, yeah, those two were reasons. the two key reasons, yeah. But it's hard for people <laughs> to turn over control. And, and I think that if you know, anyone who's out there working in, in advertising has been either in an agency or is in an act, you know, a situation where there is that um, there is that passing of the baton, but there but it's a struggle. And you know, we used to people used to call us the Hydra. I um, know because you tell them and I tell them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it was it was never malicious, and you really weren't trying to take control. It's just you had the control, and then as you tried to give it to me, you'd still like pop your head into somebody's office and say, "Hey, what are you doing?" and give them an opinion. Yeah. And you know, an opinion from the guy with the name on the door <laughs> seems like. A direction, not an opinion. Well, and that were, was a big struggle. You were also a little overly sensitive. But, I was? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. But I mean, it all worked. The thing is, it wasn't as hard for me. And I think it is very, very hard. But it wasn't as hard for me because essentially, for three or four years, you and I had basically been a creative team. You yeah. know what I mean? We, we were yeah. doing almost all the work ourselves. And, and over that time, I mean, I realized... We almost always agree. Right. I mean, 95% of the time, right. we absolutely agree on what was the best way to go. But, so. but the way we'd come to agreement was very different. Yeah. And I think that's what people struggled with, is yeah. they would think we weren't agreeing because the way we yeah. talked about it and the way we expressed it, it would, it would seem like a disconnect. But yeah, you're maybe. right. We always, did, we always did agree. But, I mean, even now, I mean, forever, we basically at least in my experience, when you and I look at work, we're almost always in agreement yeah. as to whether it's really good or not so good or really shitty. You right, know, so. right. 
And and you, uh, the reason why I, I actually joined the agency as part of my master plan um, was that was that I had learned that there'd be no such thing as print in the future, <laughs> and so. Knowing that there'd be no such thing as print, I knew that you at create, you know, Porter Creative Services, you guys did some TV, agencies do a little TV, and I wanted to you know, learn that. How can I learn TV? Uh, okay. And uh, um, you, you're and actually... Did that work out for you? Did you learn it, TV? Yeah, I learned a lot of <laughs> TV. And you, you were a director, you were directing things, so I learned how to direct. I mean, we used to direct all our own stuff in the early days, which was kind of fun. Um, yes. And I learned to edit before there was... You know, it was linear. You couldn't make a mistake. You had to put the pieces right. in order, right. in the right size, and it was a very different thing. And you had to be much more thoughtful about editing, which I think was was a good exercise. Yeah, I think it makes you a better. Editor. I mean, even with digital, it right. makes you better because you think because you can way. piece it together. Right. In it, right. Yeah, yeah. In, a, in a different way. You were talking about when you started, Sam, that there was still live TV. Oh yeah, when uh, Grand Advertising, this is where that picture was taken with. Bill Ryder and John Kufel ran advertising. They had a count uh, Dodge Plymouth, and uh, the account executive on that got edgewise with the, the account, and so I they were they had a major minor with uh, General Electric, I think, appliances on the Lawrence Welk show. Yeah. And so I flew up every Friday and sat there, and you'd rehearse the Lawrence Welk show live, total all the way through, including yeah. all the commercials. And that was the show that was infamous. Everyone knew about when they, I forget the, well, the actor's name, she tried to get the, the refrigerator door open and stuck oh, on camera. Right. That, that type of thing. We would sit out and you'd go through everything twice. Once on camera, once off. And it was a whole different thing. So they delivered the commercials live right there? Oh, yeah. yeah. They were just swinging the camera. You had, to be sit, like you had to sit there. With a guy in the control, make sure the guy was punching up the damn right slide sort of thing. That's See, pretty cool. That would, yeah. yeah. And that was so, unfortunately, just in my lifetime in the advertising business, I've seen TV just turn into so this bootstrap type of situation. But that's, yeah, that's pretty much the beginnings of TV. That's right. Right. And then, and then you know, to, to now where we're doing our own live TV show. That's right. You know? Or, or and we're going to do a live commercial in just a moment. Do you, so, do you have anything that I you want to hawk? I, I wish no? I had thought of it. <laughs> yeah, it'd be nice. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. a second. He'll have it. <laughs> what, um, what, was the, what was the question came in? What was the strangest thing, Chuck, that you have ever let me get away with? Well, <laughs> can, we, can we come back to that? Sure. What's legal? Sure, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you never really did strange things. No. You know? No. no you, you never. You were always... I mean, you were always you always I'm almost liked too fun. responsible. You were, anything, yeah. You right? were always a very responsible guy. Yeah, I think yeah. you always were. Well, you have, you know, keep going with that. Well, no, because you're an only child, and so you learn to be <laughs> independent and responsible. And, and, and yeah, so no, I, I mean, you've done some fairly crazy things, but but you've never done anything that was destructive to the agency or the work. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, you know. Now there were the I I remember. Um, um, or I didn't really realize, but I was I was competing for the uh, associate creative director job back in the day. You know, not really. That's not really. No, because no. that that's that's sort of a myth that has arisen, because there was a writer who worked with me before I came to Sam, and who I brought with me, Mary McPhail, who I think has engendered the idea that you two were competing, and that was because I didn't know we were competing. Yeah, no, you weren't. Not, no. weren't but then when I got promoted, we stopped being friends, and well, I, I never had put the two together. <laughs> I, I, I would say that she was competing, and she was great. She, she is was a, a great, wonderful she's writer. A she's a great writer. woman. Yeah. Um, but but I think when you got promoted, she felt like she had gotten passed over. She told me years later. She said, "Well, Chuck made the right choice." So, so I think she thinks that we were competing. Well, I think she right. Yeah, I, I think she does. <laughs> yeah. Here's. Uh, oh, that's you uh, and I. This, yeah, this is this is me and Chuck. Right around the time, probably. Oh, she was got a little name. before my name was put on the agency. Yeah, that was '95. Yeah. Oh, well, you, your name went on the door in '95, right? Or '96? I don't, I don't remember. It's got it in there somewhere. '95 okay. or '96. Oh yeah, there's a really small. Here it is. Yeah, it was. There huge, it is. Yeah, it was huge it. news <laughs> when I got my name on the door. There it is, right but there. But they spelled it right. So, yeah, which is nice. I think it, there nice. were. I think there was bigger news than that. We just don't have it. I don't think there was. That might. Have been. I, don't I don't think it was know. that big a deal. Um, but it was a big deal to me. I remember that that I started. Um, uh, well, I guess when I became creative director, I started drinking a lot and way too much and uh, um, 
my girlfriend at the time uh, threatened to leave me because I was drinking too much. There's a lot of pressure being creative director. I well, realized was, I never had were, a drinking problem before but, that. And also, but you were very young, you know what I mean? And also, <laughs> we were in, I mean, you were very young to be a creative You were like 27 or 28 when you became creative What's director. Right? Yeah, it's like 28, I think. And we were growing. And also, you know, we had, we had huge aspirations, you know. I mean, we really wanted to be something really special. So that's a lot of pressure, you know. So, yeah. You, yeah. you uh, Chuck, Chuck's um, friends went to high school with Pat Fallon. Junior high. Junior high, yeah. and when I and when I met Chuck, um, he would tell me stories about Fallon and what they had done, and I didn't know much about advertising, and and Chuck convinced me that we can do what Fallon. Did. He's like, I know these guys, you know, I mean they're smart guys, but they're not anything that special. We can do this, and I totally bought into it. You did. That's I really true. did. Yeah, 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 I yeah. totally bought into it, but I but it turned out to be a lot harder. <laughs> Than, than I think we expected. It's hard. It's I mean, really hard. Those guys, you know, I mean, every every agency that's successful, I guess, is successful in a different way. But, you know, Fallon started out, it was like six guys, and they started it. And a year later, they got the Wall Street Journal. So, I mean, that was, you know, an instant, because they did good work. It took us longer. But, I mean, uh, I think that, I think it was always true. I mean, it was always about the work. And whenever you looked at the work from early on, certainly from, shortly after Alex got there. Whenever you looked at the work and compared it to the work that was being done in the world, it was great. I mean, at least a lot of it was really great. And so we just had faith that if we keep doing this really great work, eventually we're gonna get discovered. I think the, you know, one of the reasons why you wanted me to be creative director is because I, I, I wasn't okay with any of the work not being good. I remember yes, you used to tell me, crazy. like, just, yeah. just crazy. relax. Like, it's okay if some of it's <laughs> I know. You used to drive me completely crazy. But then you decided, okay, rather than getting crazy, just harness that maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, well, ultimately, I had no choice because you were so passionate and crazy about it. And, I, and people would come to me, all of the account people, all 100% of the account people, at one time or another came in and said, I hate Alex. I wish he was dead. He's driving me crazy. We've got a deadline. He won't let the work go. Do, do, do. And so for about a year, I would go in and say, they all hate you. you got to get... Yeah. And, and then I finally realized, this is not the way to do this. The way to do it is to say, do the greatest work in the world. Yeah. But it was, you know... It or was... promote him, because then they, yeah, can't, right. then they can't hate you, then they right? Can't it's hate like, you, you yeah. can't hate your boss right. that much. Right? Yeah, so... Yeah. But no, no, I know it was... I mean, it was... I mean, you're a pretty relentless guy. Um, Sam, what do you what as you watched the agency? Was there a moment where you thought, okay, this this could take off? That well, I'll tell you one one of the great campaigns that uh, the original no smoking campaign you put together. Truth, yeah, truth. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we had national national kind of like Beatrice Foods, but you know those are it, semi-industrial kind of steel whole hum. We had Bertram Yas. A lot of business to business. That's stuff. right, type yeah. of thing. Uh, but then when we uh, that no smoking account thing. And oh, one of the little interesting things you asked about, crazy things that Chuck, they were bidding the no smoking account, and Chuck was running down the street to find a place to have a quick cigarette. Before <laughs> they got make, there. Make sure no one involved with the yeah. choice of the agency on smoke, no smoking. So Chuck spent half his time becoming a track star right up down the street. Look, I never did know where he went to find it. You know, and, smoke, and, but, and, and I think like there were there were a lot of smokers in the agency. And, oh yeah, oh, yeah, then yeah. And and I think that that in a way it, it was it was the best thing for the work because it it sort of forced the work to find that place where it wasn't judgmental about smoker or not smoker or feel bad if you're smoking or health effects or you know it it really became. Um, about the industry and, and, and what, was, what was being sold to you as a, as a teen. And I think that, you know, the fact that we had, you know, people who smoked and they're good people and you can't vilify those people and we shouldn't. And That's right. it really shaped the work in a good way. Actually, but it was hard. The, the agency yeah. was, was split on that, more for the, around the idea of whether we should take government work. That's I exactly remember. right. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah, well, it's because we had never done, actually, I think we had done, we, I think we did one pitch very early on for like the lottery in Florida or something, That's and right. it was such a mess and so political, and and it was the first time we ever got involved with like lobbyists, and, and it just the whole thing felt not very good. So yeah. that was the issue. Yeah, I mean we were yeah. all in favor of the program, but then you, not very long after we got Truth, after the first research came in, and and it was clear that all of the ads that said don't smoke, it's not good for you, made kids smoke more. I mean, you once said we should just give them their money back. 
because there's yeah. no way that we can solve this problem yeah. for them. We're just going to hurt we them. We were really afraid yeah. to do the wrong thing. Yeah, That's we right. were afraid that, that whatever we did, we were going to spend their money, and it was going to exacerbate the problem. Yeah. So, I mean, that was finding that strategy was, in my view, the true genius of that campaign. And, and it was also the first time we had enough money to really show That's exactly what right. we had learned in the bike business and the B2B work that we've done, you know, the things that, that we had learned along the way being small and scrappy. That's we right. kind of had enough money to, to really magnify that stuff. And, yes. And I think yeah, that people was... people saw it. People saw the work. Question came in, Chuck, how do you egos play into the chemistry between you and Bogusky? Young Adlanders think Alex walks on water, not so much, you not so much. That's so mean. But <laughs> what, uh, I'll answer that. Uh, I, I'll just say, I'll just, <coughs> I, Chuck is my mentor. Right, so m probably most of what I know about advertising, I learned from you. I learned some from my, you know, dad. Obviously, I learned from Sam, but but most from you. So you know, uh, this business. So isn't, take that, take young that, ad you ad ad you're young But this ad business, I, I, it's just this business is not. It can be about superstars, I think, but it but it is not here. It never has been. It's always about. Uh, um, it's very much a, a team sport at Crispin, and, and it's, it's all been about getting it a little bit further you know, down the field, moving, moving the ball and progressing, and, and uh, so Plus that's also, all I'll say. I mean I, have, I mean, I have no ego at this point, although if you could <laughs> zoom in on me a little bit, I'm thinking of a frame about like this, roughly, <laughs> for the rest of the show. Yeah. So how, is this going okay so far? Is I like this it. Show going okay? I like it. I like yeah. doing. I like the little dead air that just happened. Yeah. You know, it makes it feel real. Yeah. It's you know, live. You're, you're you know, talking about that the most bumpy the cam. Yeah. One of the accounts we had a lot of fun with was the Mini Cooper account. That yeah. was a fun account. Unfortunately, yeah. we got the thing selling, so they didn't think they needed to say more. But that happened. No, yeah. actually, we we let them go. Yeah, I guess that's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which was, I think, <coughs> in some ways, I think it was a mistake. It was it was too small, probably realistically, for it to yeah. be our only ca car yeah. account. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. Like my heart is hard not to have many. You know, the way yeah. it just and and the. The worst decisions I've made in business are the ones that I make with, with my head. Yeah. And the ones that always work out for me are the ones I make with my heart. And and, uh, um, but it gets harder. It gets harder and harder as you grow to make the decisions with 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 your heart. I think. Yeah, but I think in the advertising business you can't get too far from that because, in the account handling and working with people, one of the worst part, and and I fell victim to this. You get a couple of counts. Then they start owning you because yeah, it's so big you can't. They keep you from having time to do other accounts, and I really got trapped because yeah. people would come in and people think I had the handle account and check it, you know. So we we were being trapped by a couple of accounts. I, the, I think your guys' relationship started what is what is really healthy, which which is we're known as a creative shop, but the creatives that really excel here understand that the account people probably make a bigger difference in how good the work is than the creative people. You know, I've said that before, yeah. that you can have great creative people, but if you don't have a, 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 a relationship where the work is going to get sold, That's right. it just doesn't matter. Um, so like that, that deference to the account person and the, and, and the account people's deference to the creatives is, is what's led to, I think, a lot, of, a lot of good work. Well, I think that's right. There's a lot of agencies that I've seen, and a lot of bakers that aren't here anymore for one person goes in and takes credit for everything, and that just can't happen in the yeah. advertising business. It's not realistic. And, you know, and we can talk about creative and account handling, but, you know, the guy who's supervising the work, the traffic department, you can't get along with any of those things because if they fail, slow down, yeah. you're dead. You can yeah. do the best work in the world, but if you don't deliver it, yeah. and it's done right in the best way, you're going to lose an account. Well, I, you know, when we have interns here, one of the things I tell them is, you have no idea, you have no ability to tell whether something's a big deal or a small deal in advertising. Yeah, right? that's right. So if someone asks you to look for a photograph or someone you know, asks you to find, find, let's just say find a photograph, maybe it feels like not a big deal. You don't find that photograph, the art director doesn't get the photograph, isn't able to comp up the ad for the presentation, the ad doesn't get presented or the idea doesn't get that's presented right. in the way that someone wanted it to be. You just ruined the entire thing. As, as, exactly as an right. intern, it all fell apart because you didn't do your part. That's right. So understanding that all the way up and down 
you know, the latter is really important for advertising to succeed because it is, it definitely is a team sport. And one person anywhere in there can, can screw it up. Yeah. But I think, I, uh, you know, you're talking about, like, whatever it is, you know, mutual respect between. I mean, we never had in the agency from the day I got there anyway, there never was that sort of animosity between creative and account, you know, which was very much, I think, uh, the culture of the advertising business, especially back then. It's the then. joke of the advertising. Yeah, like, like, it's, like, it's kind of cool. Like, there's guys, suits yeah. and, the, and, like, the creatives, you know, make fun of them. Yeah. And it's really destructive. It's horrible. Yeah. And, and, and we were very lucky because, you know, because we started out small for a whole bunch of reasons. We never had that sort of animosity or antagonism because it is enormously destructive. And, it, and also... It just makes people think in a very bad, sort of malicious way. Like, whole us against them is ugly. Yeah. Well, also, it gets back, again, we're talking about running a business strictly for the financial end of it. I know it back, going back to talk about it because we're not in business anymore, grant advertising. It got the point that you couldn't have anyone else unless who's, who's going to pay for his time? How are we going to charge right. the account? I mean, everything was a money decision, not a creative decision, not right. a handling decision. It, it, sure, that's got to be there someplace along the line. You just can't go crazy. But you also can't do good work if, if your the hands are bound, your legs, you can't go out and talk if you about really, that. If you really think accounting is a refined instrument for running a business, it's you not. will fail. It is, a, it is extremely blunt. That's right. Yeah. And, and I think that that was one of the things that, that I learned from you and then stepped into the job with enough confidence to say, this is a false economy. You know, the idea that we're going to take hours away from this or we're going to stop work here, this is, this is inaccurate. It may seem accurate based on accounting, but, you know, more and more, and I think more and more of the, the, some of the issues we face as, a, as, as an economy and as a, as a, as a, as a nation and, as, a, um, and, and a, as corporations, this tool of accounting, you can't really follow it to the letter. We need no, actually a new right. way to account for things that's more realistic and, and is more human, but I've definitely seen it on a level here that taught me a lot. Yeah, no, I think, well, yeah, I think that's true. And I think that it is, I mean, like Sam said, grant advertising, I never knew them, but I certainly, I mean, everybody knows a lot of agencies who became financially focused and it was not good for them. No, it's not good. No. It's not good. Now, there were some things that were funny, though, like, you know, Chuck Porter is the, is the to me, sort of the original culture of the agency, right? Like, one of the things you get when you hire Chuck is you get a little box of culture that you can just unwrap. It's like, <laughs> explodes all over mm -hmm. um, everything. And, and, uh, and I've tried to um, do my part for that as well. But, but I think, you know, Chuck, you are the, you are the son, I think, of the, of the agency culture. And, and um, there were weird things at the beginning about the agency, like, and I just... We were only allowed to have putty-colored desk yeah. accessories. I remember that. Well, that being was one. with the designer. Yeah, all, all desk accessories are, are are putty. Yeah, I remember that. And that was something that was an, it was it was interesting, um, and valuable. The stuff that, and I don't think this stuff was you, Sam. This was like other people, you know, making dictates about how the agency could be run, and and some of those we peeled off early on, or you peeled off early on, um, and as we grew. We knew not to add them back. I thought that was really valuable. We, I mean, I think we tried not to. One of yeah. the benefits, and, and probably one of the benefits all three of us had, is that we never really spent a lot of time at any other agency. Yeah. So we always kind of made it up as we went along. We didn't bring a lot of baggage. You know, we didn't come after 25 years at, at anybody, Leo Burnett or yeah. whoever, you know. Yeah. So you kind of make it up. But I think also um, it's the hardest thing, as we've gotten big, that, exactly what you're talking about, is the hardest thing to maintain. Yeah. Because there will always be people, well-meaning people who come in and say, look, we, we would save money if we did things that way, or yeah. things would be better if we did things that way, or you know, we ought to make people do this, or we ought to make people do that. Yeah. And, and to, to prevent that from happening is really hard. It's and, a full-time job. And like right now, I don't know if you, if you know Sam, but we've got a monk that comes into yeah, the office. Monk, yeah. And does these, you know, in, in Boulder, we need a Miami monk too, which sounds cool. Um, but he does these, these sessions on mindfulness, right? And, and some people don't go, but a lot of people go. A lot of people love them. That's, that's the putty, that's the putty or, or that, that could be replaced by the putty de yeah, desk accessory right now. Yeah. That's one of those things where, you know, I worry, you know, will we still have that sort of random cultural 
benefit that just kind of makes no sense and is real easy to say, hey, we've got to cut some costs, we've got to get rid of, yeah, yeah. get rid of the monk. And I know it would be a <coughs> false economy. But I mean, it's all, you know, I can remember one time early on, Sam, probably the first year I was there, where there was uh, somebody, a copywriter, a woman copywriter came in on the weekend and spilled coffee on her computer, okay, it was there on a Sunday. And I remember a, a memo, a memo then came, that came through me or circulated through me that said, okay, you know, you spill this coffee on your computer and we have to bill you for it because you're not supposed to have coffee on your desk, so it's 90 bucks and we're going to take it out of your pay. And I couldn't, <laughs> and I, I literally couldn't believe it. And, and I, I remember you and I had a conversation and I'm like, okay, whoever made this decision, they really can't work here anymore. You know what I mean? That's I, a I still know who made that decision. I do too. I, do, yeah, I, I know who made it. <laughs> they were gone shortly thereafter. But, but I mean, stuff like that, and, and this is a person who's probably not an evil person, but they're just, you know, you get these, like, well, this is the rule, and, like, you know, don't come in on, and don't have coffee on this. It's hard. It's yeah. hard to keep that up. Well, Jeff Hicks, who I think, uh, you know, um, obviously huge in terms of changes to the agency and, right. and, 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 uh, and, and the success of the agency, when, when he first came in, he was fresh out of uh, Harvard, right, had gone, finished his MBA, had spent a whole bunch of time at Leo Burnett. Eight years at Leo Burnett. And, yeah. and I remember the, f the <laughs> first time I got to really interact with him in a meeting, he pulled out a chart and, it's, and it showed all our accounts and it showed the ones we're making a lot of money on and then it showed the ones that we're losing money on, right? Hourly um, expense. Cost analysis. Yeah. yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. And, and uh, he said, if we just get rid of these, right, we'll be incredibly profitable. And, and I just brought up the point, but what work will you show in the meetings? Because it was all the stuff over here that supposedly we were losing business or losing money on. Um, and you obviously can't grow without doing great work. So, you know, that it was a good example to me. But now Jeff, to his credit, he's become... He's a born again. Yeah, yeah right, I mean, yeah. he's become more zealot about this than anybody. And, and, right. um, but it was for for me. It was one of those moments where I thought the agency could swing one way or the other. I really didn't know. Yeah, you right? hit the crossroads. Yeah, there was a potential that we could that's right. get all behind the dollar, and it just wouldn't work. Well, that's well. A lot of a lot of the agencies not here any longer have d did that. Yeah, and a lot of creative work went down the well with it. So, and great accounting people understand that as well. I yeah. mean, I think we're lucky at the agency. We have people like Eric Lear. Um, and Carl, who understand that uh, that their instrument's a little blunt, yeah. and and they and 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 they and and are passionate about the work. I mean, if you have a, a CFO that's passionate about the work that you're doing, that's amazing for an agency. It, I don't think is, there are many that have that. But I think they've learned it here. I mean, even Eric. Eric Lear is our COO, and he's he is sensational. But when he first came. He came with the same sort of preconceptions that business people come with. Well, yeah. look at you're losing money on this, you're making money on this. This seems like a no-brainer, but but he learned very very fast. This is where the soul of the agency is, and now he's another you know crazy fanatic guardian of the soul of the agency. But but it's not natural. You know, most yeah. people who come here, business people, don't come here saying, well, you know, the most important thing for us to do is to embrace the creative and the work. They come saying, how can I make this business better? And what, they learn. What advice would you have for somebody who's starting an agency right now? That's a tough question. I'm here to ask the tough Actually, questions. Actually. <laughs> this is no cakewalk, Sam. The, the problem today is totally different was when I started out in the agency business. First of all, I was young enough not to know it better. That might be a key. <laughs> That's probably, <laughs> probably the first step. And... Uh, you have to believe in yourself, and you have to believe in the people that you're going to be associated with, and that's part of it. Is it, it you know, it's like a human body. I mean, I mean, do we need two arms, two, you know, yeah. five fingers? I mean, how can you get rid of one of those if the, they all are part of the whole? And I think that's important. Of it. It's like doing a tango. You can't do it by yourself. So. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, actually, Chuck and I sort of got a little bit of a joke because the two of us got so involved with a couple of accounts that... We were there together in a thing. We suffered together with it, so <laughs> I won't mention any names. But <laughs> well, you wind up, you wind up. Uh, I think it's interesting that that you have to have faith in each other to That's some degree exactly right. because you do get embattled 
and you do, you know, you get criticism of me from account people, or um, and, and you and you got to decide whether you're going to listen to that or whether you're going to say, okay, I've made my I've my, made my bet, and I'm going to stick with that. Um, and I've always I've always tried to ha have faith in the person that you've put in that role and that's listen to them first. That's key. I'll tell you, funny enough, it's sort of like I did a lot of sailboat racing and sailing, and you can always tell someone who really is going to win races consistently and get where they want to go and sail. If you get a hold of the tiller and you oversteer, you're just going all over the place and not going to go any place. A person with a light hand on the thing, get the boat balanced, is going to go fastest and get there the quickest that way. And I think that's sort of the way of writing an agency and be part of an agency because you have to realize that you know, there are all, all sorts of parts working together yeah. and, and you have to let them work together. And light just, hand on the tiller. I was just thinking, what a that's, metaphor. That's, that's pretty sweet. Good. I like that. And maybe why there's so many commercials where people are sailing, and yeah, then it's for an insurance company mm -hmm. or something. It yeah. really works Financial, for Financial, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah. rowing. Yeah. A lot yeah. of rowing yeah. commercials. Yeah. Um, no, but that's actually, that's actually good. You've put it differently in terms of hiring people. And, and well, yeah, I mean, what I've always believed is that, is that you know, I, I think you grow your agency by hiring really great entry-level people. I mean, we've right. always done that here. We've yeah. always grown people from the inside, by and large. Um, and I think you know what I've always tried to do is just assume that everybody that we hire is just as smart and motivated and passionate as I am. So you know, assume that they're going to be great, and, and at least half the time they are. You know, and, yeah. and 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 you have to hand it over. You know, I think that I think it's very very hard for people like Sam or for people like me who are in sort of on the ground floor to to let go because control is fun and it's good and to but. But it's the single most important thing, in my view, to growing anything, whether it's an advertising agency or anything else, is finding great people and giving part of it to them. And, you know, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I've always... Uh, you, you, well, they, you if say, they don't feel like they're part of it, <coughs> they're not going to contribute their best. Yeah, so. yeah. In fact, if you do give them the room to, to do their best work, it almost can be a tough thing for people to handle because they put so much pressure on themselves. When well, you, if they're good, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, you, and then that's really what management starts to become. If if you're doing it right, is supporting people and saying, "What do you need? You're doing great. Don't kill yourself. You need to go home now because you've worked enough." You know, yeah. because the amount of pressure people can put on themselves is is way more than any manager can put on themselves. That's for sure. I've I've always said I've always put it that you that that there's no such thing as management. There's only mismanagement. So I try to do as little as possible. So I, you know, I'm going to mismanage my people as little as like as I as I can, because um, yeah, I don't I really think that. anyone does it that great. You'd have to be managed by yourself. I agree. Really well, I mean, I think that really good people are essentially unmanageable, yeah. which is the way you want them to be. You <laughs> yeah. know what I mean, and so, but I, you know, it's it's light hand on the tiller. Light hand on yeah. the tiller. It's a light hand. But on you know, the sometimes you have to. You watch someone have an idea, they got to be free to go off that way, and then. Let them get it out of their mind and realize that they got to turn and attack the other way, and that's yeah. And having that's where confidence with each other comes into play. That's exactly though. right. Because it, because it, in a in a bad situation, you don't feel that you can explore and that you could come back. That's right. And in a, in a good creative creative department, you feel confident. I can okay. I'm here. Someone's leading me to explore further. Yeah. I really like where I am, but I can go out here, and if and if they're wrong. If I'm wrong, we can come back to it. Exactly right. Yeah. And I think that's key, the thing. I think it's key, too. So, I think it's key, too. There's well, a you ask, you know, we're kidding about <laughs> Chuck Ryan copying the plane. But, you know, I had total faith in Chuck. And I, I, I knew what I thought. And I also knew he's a hell of a lot better copyright than I'd ever be. <laughs> so yeah. I realized my limitations. So yeah. <laughs> and Thank God we're not all the same. I can barely draw a straight line. So <laughs> Thank God we're not all the same, though. Exactly you know? right. I, 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 the thing that I struggle the most, most with is, is, the, is the accounting, you know, and, and having people like, like Eric Lear and Carl who can help you and explain those things. For me, it's, it's another language. For them, it's so simple, and what I do seems very complicated. Thank God, there's different kinds yeah. of people. I wish I, I wish in some ways I had more accounting in college because I didn't have. I had yeah. one course. I think I you said, did if fine. I have, if I have to do this for a living, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try and make enough money to pay someone to do it. So, <laughs> yeah. 
So a question coming in from Ed Flynn. Can we get Chuck and Sam's thoughts on the digital revolution in the ad biz? <laughs> Chuck, do you want to start with Chuck? You want to start? I know when to pass the ball. <laughs> well, I'm against it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sam. <laughs> if Chuck's against it, I'm with him. All right, so we're, we're against it. Good, good. Um, anything to add to that? No, I think that's a perfect. I may be for it one day, but today yeah, I'm against it. Can you add anything to it? <laughs> God, I he's talk about it all the time. I, I I've been, yeah, I've, I've kind of come out. Yeah. I've kind of come out for it. I have to be against it, or otherwise we'll go completely over the edge. So, so. Yeah. Um, so. Anything uh, to add? This is we're sort of coming to a close here. It's been really fun this for was me. This terrific. It's yeah. been really fun well, I, for me. I really enjoy sitting them. down with the two of you. I come in, I feel like I don't want to interrupt. <laughs> I feel the brain cells working back and forth, <laughs> so I don't want to get in the way yeah. of that. You no, know? oh, it's amazing to, to <coughs> I think, have us all together. It's really right. fun. And, and, and uh, for, for people who are getting in the business and kids in school to be able to, you know, see what it is. It, even the overnight sensation parts of it, it's no overnight sensation. It's about nine years. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, but, you know, yeah. this intern situation you've had going on here really is so important, bringing because we get an awful lot of good, good young people coming into the agency. And, yeah. and I know I've talked to some people who have come in and done intern work and back to school. You know, it, it, it's amazing what I hear back, you know, indirectly came back from some schools, what they say about it about the age see and what's going on down here and that's really good on the thing so it is good it is good we're proud of that intern yeah. thing we got going it's crazy we had a thousand applications for this year's class really mm -hmm. yeah which is hopefully that's some good. Will hopefully really we, good. hopefully we pick good. the right ones yeah, that's I hope right. yeah. well I hope yeah. time will tell you know there's no way to know I, that's what know, I think. It's like could could I would never have gotten I would never qualify for the Crispin internship right now. Whatever the qualifications may be, <laughs> Any, no matter what, whatever they are, I, you know. I wouldn't either, so. None of us. That's sort of one of the things I worry about. It's like you wouldn't have made it. I, you wouldn't that's have made true. it, and I wouldn't have made it. You know. It's like yeah, I'm sending some samples, but I'm really good. Yeah, that ain't gonna. That's not gonna cut it. So I what know. about those? Chuck was very convincing when he said it. I was. Yeah. How do we? How do we? How do we get the the fuck offs and ne'er do wells to? come back <laughs> I don't into know. the The only way the I know is to find the world's most brilliant recruiter who can sit across from these people and, and figure out. I mean, it's like you and I used to do. You know, when we were little, we couldn't afford to hire super senior experienced people, so we just learned to hire smart, talented kids. I mean, we hired a guy one time who came in and talked to me, and he had gone to Berkeley, and he had majored in the geopolitics of religion, and he was sitting across from me. He's like, well, I got a friend in Boca, and I'm staying with him, and I heard about advertising, and it sounds interesting. And we hired him. It was Michael Bettenberg. Mike, yeah, yeah. and he was and he really was great. great, you really know. Great. But it just—I don't know. It's an instinctive thing, and sometimes you're right. But yeah. I think the only way to do it is for you to talk to him. Yeah. So I'm a you perfect have to for, for, me to, for yeah. me to talk. I'm to a perfect him. recruit. I have almost a major in chemistry. There you go. There it is. There you go. <laughs> there it is. Chemistry, journalism. <laughs> well, high, know, school, Sam, high school, high school equivalent. Sam, <laughs> Sam was a pre-med student. I actually, oh, I, really? I was accepted to. to Two different med schools came down here. Are oh, you ruining my and, whole theory? And never, never, <laughs> never went to school. I stayed. So. All right. Well, that's good. Yeah, that's good. We're out of time. Um, great show. Hope that everyone enjoyed it. Tweet in some ideas for for other shows you'd like to see, and we'll we'll make it happen. Thank you. Bye bye. Let's shoot the shit. Right on. Let's pontificate, family master.